Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Woke by Accident Podcast. It is a weekly chat about socially conscious topics impacting the culture. I'd like to extend my gratitude in you listening to this podcast. It means everything to me, and I hope it is clear that this subject matter is so important to me. I care about our people, our future, and making a positive change in this nation. This episode is powered by Poddex. Welcome to another episode of Woke by Accident Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Trey Styles, author of Black Boy Arise and host of the podcast Black Man Talk. Trey is back on the show to chop it up with us today. Welcome to the show, Trey, or as they say in Detroit, what up, though? What up, though? <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah how are you? Back. Yeah, how are you? I've been good. I'm just taking it one day at a time, uh, just trying to stay healthy and strong. Great, great. I've been trying to check out um, your YouTubes as you post them and yeah. um, looking forward to a new book that you were supposed to be working on. How's that going? It's going. I'm, uh, I'm pretty much in uh, the final editing phases of it. I just uh, got to get to my editor and it should, it should be here in a, in a couple months, I was like. So I'm really proud of it. You know, uh, a, a lot of things have uh, went on that uh, like kind of slowed the progress of it. I okay. had caught, uh, like the late part of last year. I had caught uh, I had caught COVID in oh. uh, in November of, of last year. You know, and I, and I finished. I actually had finished it like November first, which is weird. And I called. I still remember these days. So I never forget this day because it was a lot of sad things going on. You know, because I caught COVID at the same uh, place that my grandmother caught it at. And uh, unfortunately, you know, she passed away from it. So, oh. so, so that that devastated me because that was my grandma was like, <clears throat> besides my mama was my only constant I've had in my life. Like the people that been there from the root to the fruit. So that 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 took you know that, that had a devastating uh, effect on me for sure. Yeah, sorry to hear about your grandmother. I appreciate that. So, you know, so that slowed down things. You know, my my energy wasn't right. You know, quite naturally. So I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't write nothing. I couldn't really, really do much when hitting the gym, when doing nothing, because other than going out to work, but, you know, even that was tough. And, uh, you know, but, uh, so that, that, that slowed down, you know, the progress of the book and, mm-hmm. you know, then it was, I had a great uncle passed away and I was close mm-hmm. to him. It was a, a lot of people from the neighborhood died, a lot of them from like COVID, some from asthma. It was just a lot of, a lot of, uh, hurtful things happened in the end of the year that kind of, you know, brought the new year with a with like a heavy heart in a way. So yeah, so slow down a lot of you know uh, a lot of progress. You know, it takes time. You, know, you never really get fully healed from somebody dying that you real close to. You just learn how to deal mm-hmm. with it better. So I just slowed down a whole lot of things because if those things didn't trans- transpire, the book probably be here right now, and I'll probably be showing it on the show right now. But okay. I just slowed down a whole lot of the things. But you know, I'm, I'm back and you know. Uh, getting things together and it oh. should be here a couple months i was gonna say fall for sure and you're feeling better um oh, m- m- much better much better and i, and I was actually su- surprised because you know you know my, me and my grandma are super super close i mean like me and my mom like my mom that's you know so i got so many fond memories of her and it was just so sudden i just knew in my mind that i would have you no know, she was older so of course but i just knew i would have more years with her i just yeah. i just knew more, more time with her and so they're just, they're just, you know, it's just, it's just weird when you, when they gone. I remember going away from the house that she lived in for a while and going over there. Mm-hmm. And my cousin was there, and my little cousin was crying. It's like it's weird when we see you because you always was coming here to see grandma and all us here. And I know, I know it's weird. I said it takes time because I, I lost my mama's mama when I was ten. So mm-hmm. I said I know, I know how hard it is for them because when you experience like the first death of somebody that you, you don't see that happening with, you know, so. Just being there for them, and you know, so it just, it just uh, I don't know, it just it just, it just slowed things down for me, you know. And then just trying to live life, and you know how we adults, we got bills to pay, we got things to do, and all those things. So trying to maintain, along with coping with that, uh, that uh, that death was, you know, it, it took a big toll. Yeah, definitely, um, death, death, difficult to deal with loss, especially um, in a short period of time, losing two relatives close together like that. Yeah. yeah, it was. 
and you are the author of Black Boy Arise. I think the first time we had you on, you talked about that. Um, briefly, tell us about Black Boy Arise for the listeners that may not be aware of that particular book. Okay. Black Boy Arise is my memoir. It was uh, about me growing up in the city of Detroit. Uh, it talks about the family dynamics I was born into, born into like a born into poverty, working class community. Uh, I was uh, pretty much exposed to everything that anybody could really be exposed to. And a lot of things I was exposed to wasn't good. You know, coming up in a family with drug abuse, uh, people who, st- who deal drugs, uh, a lot of uh, teen pregnancy, mm-hmm. a lot of high school dropouts. And not too many role models. And for me, I could have ended up the same way many people in my family ended up, but some just clicked on to me, you know, through depression, I looked for some kind of escape and I wasn't gonna commit suicide. So I wasn't, for various reasons, I was scared to do it. I didn't wanna leave my mom. And I was brought to believe you committed suicide as a as a as a kid, you would go to hell. So those are three things that kept me here. You know, other than that, I wouldn't be here. And I found an escape, and I found the great escape. My escape was through reading and getting knowledge of self and understanding why my environment was the way it was, why my people was the way they were, why my family was the way you know it was. And through that, you know, that that uh, it made me stronger, just getting more understanding. And I went through a lot, a lot of ups and downs, and a lot of Things I discuss in that book about my some of the most personal things you could think of that young men go through and that people that we go through as a people appear. And for me, Black Boy Rise was the perfect title because I come from the, I guess you say the trenches. Some people they think of trenches, they don't say, oh, the trenches because oh, I was selling the uh, uh, drugs or something like that. No, the, I come from the trenches too. I just I just did mine a legal way, <laughs> which I encourage right. a lot of. A lot of black men you know to do so i just talked about everything i want my time in uh high school everything uh, as a as a young professional my boss with women i had to learn things i had to unlearn things and so it's just it's, just, it's raw I'm like if you really want to know some of the things that men go through and young men go through if you got a son or you, you you got a man you go you go find it in black boy rise because i'm blunt and I shared things that most of us say I wouldn't even share. So that, that's what Black Boy Ross is about. You know, it's just my, uh, it's just my, uh, my, my work I gave to the world. You know, that that could live forever. That could possibly encourage some people. To, you know, to know that they can do better despite the circumstances they're born into. Definitely. So I did. Uh... Pull up Black Boy Arise on Amazon is where people can purchase that. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So I brought that up, guys. Black Boy Arise. It is available on Amazon. The Kindle version, Kindle version, and the paperback is available on um, Amazon right now. So definitely want to support um, African American authors and entrepreneurs. Um, I did read Black Boy Arise. It was a really great story. Very personal. Um, like you said, you shared you know very personal stories. But I think people could learn a lot from it. And I definitely find a lot of value in that. I appreciate that. Oh, for sure. And so we have a few topics that we're going to touch on. And uh, Trey has agreed to go over these with me. So the first one was about the update in the Patrick Laola uh, police shooting. We may remember back on April 4th, Patrick Laola, who is a 26-year-old refugee from the Democratic Republic of the Congo was fatally shot in the back of the head um, by, by the officer Christopher Schur in Grand Rapids. And this is actually um, in your neck of the woods in Detroit. Are you familiar with Grand Rapids? Is that kind of further out? Well, we can see Grand Rapids, Detroit, we kind of uh, like in southeast Michigan. Grand Rapids is kind of like uh, west Michigan. So it's a couple okay. hours away. That's the home of Floyd Mayweather. That's where okay. he's from. Floyd okay. Mayweather is from Grand Rapids. So, so I'm aware of that, you know, and, uh, but it, it, it is a couple hours away, but you no, know, the, the same thing going on, you know, it's, it's just a, a smaller city, but it's the second largest city in Michigan, uh, Grand Rapids. You know, oh. So uh, 
what's going on there is no different from what's going on in St. Louis and my sure. city and their city. So it, it's sad, you know, when the, you know, I read up on and see that he's, you know, the person shot execution style, basically. Yeah. Like, you know, the head, I mean, like, wow, in the back of the head. Like, wow, wow. Right. And so it took a while for them to even release the name of the officer. And then they um, finally released his name. And so now the update is that this officer is being charged with second degree murder for the fatal shooting of Patrick Leola, and he's been fired. So um, I guess they have you know, completed their investigation with everything that occurred. I know a lot of people have been kind of sympathetic to this officer because, um, you know, he did kind of give him chase or, you know, initiate a struggle or what have you. Uh, what is your kind of thoughts on that part? Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's difficult because it's it is like the same thing keeps happening. And I, I will say this. I'll say this uh, with the, with the pro police brutality thing. It's like uh, we can always say what we do in situations. Because I said what I would do in a situation. But I mean, if like you shooting him in the back of the head, I mean, is, is there any, because I read on though, they said that he had, did he take the stun gun or something like that? Right. The guy, because it looks like at first it may have been a misunderstanding because he did have a heavy accent. You know, he's like the immigrant and he got out of the, because this is a traffic stop. This wasn't like they were, you know, coming to serve a warrant to this guy. It was a traffic stop, but he got out of the car to talk to the officer. He asked for documents and then I guess he just kind of panicked and he kind of, you know, made a motion as though he was running. And so that's spark the scuffle that is described and i guess at some point um they're saying he did reach for his taser so um and then they're you know struggling and, and you know in in this um exchange and you're wondering like where is this officer's backup to kind of de-escalate things so he didn't have any uh, backup like or they hadn't got there yet but it just seems like as far as his solutions of what he was grabbing for and struggling with this man, you know, to shoot somebody in the back of the head is not the answer. And I think that's why they had to come with those charges because you can't just shoot somebody in the back of the head. Right. Because I mean, shooting in the back, back of the head is like, that's like in the way they were treating. Cause like in, in Michigan, you know, I think, I don't know what it's like in, 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 you know, in Missouri, but like in Michigan, if someone's still in your car and even if you're a licensed carrier, you can't shoot them. If I was oh, coming, really? yeah. If I was coming outside and somebody was still in my car, I can't shoot them. Okay, I think we have the castle doctrine here, yeah. um, yeah. but it's still, you know, yeah, we do yeah. have the castle because there's been people that have been shot, um, you know, breaking in people's house, and they have been excused, in it, so to speak, because yeah. of that castle doctrine. Yeah, so if somebody's like breaking in your car, you can't shoot them, but if it's like a carjacking, then you can shoot them. Cause that's like okay. life threatening. That's like your yeah. life is in danger. Now, somebody now also I understand if somebody like here is breaking into your house, but like they're in your house and like if you shoot them in the back of the head, it's like they're retreating. Yeah. So it's a good chance you can still get in, you know get in trouble for for that. Now it was it was one strange incident like that happened in Detroit years ago when a guy broke into somebody's house and the guy chased him, and he chased the guy and he shot him. So I know that that's still a little different, but. Right. But shooting in the back of the head, I mean, I mean, like, I'm, I'm thinking like if he's if you shooting in the back of the head, I mean, if you had to shoot him, could could you you couldn't shoot him in the leg or something, the back of the leg? I mean, which which I mean, something like that. I mean, you know, just right. you get back up. And don't get me wrong, I know some leg wounds can be fatal. You know what I'm saying? That's but true. The, but the likelihood it probably is not as great. Or you shoot somebody in the back of the head, that's like that's straight up execution style. It is, and it's horrifying. I don't know if you saw the video, but there's two videos. Um, one actually captures this moment mm -hmm. when he does uh, that particular action, and it's very gruesome. Um, like I think his body camera had failed by that point from the struggle or what have you, but mm -hmm. the guy he was in the car with, I believe, was capturing it, and it's from his vantage point that you can see that part of what happens and um you know immediately you know people were protesting in the family um and a lot of the activists got involved i think that's what helped um yeah. create 
the awareness that this is not right, you know, even aside from the struggle that he gave him um, or the chase or whatever you want to call it, you know, you can't just, you know, he took it, he went too far in, in this case, so. Yeah, especially if you, 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 you chase him, I mean, like, he's not wanted for murder. I mean, he's, I mean, it's not like he was, I mean, was he trying to seriously hurt you or was he trying to get away? Nothing and he wasn't going to gonna get too far anyway, especially with backup on the way, probably. He wasn't getting very far. And, and that's what I, what I say with, like, a lot of these cops. It's, it's, it's You just never know. And then how, even though he was from the Congo, you know, still black. So yeah. how, how how we portray in the medium, like animals, or like we just violent. Yeah. Black males in particular, a lot of these people don't really have contact with us at all. So they come with, they, they had this in their mind that you're dealing with black men, you're dealing with an animal a lot of times. And they feel like you like, so when you deal with them, they, they already had this mentality that we we unruly. So sometimes they, they go on, you never know what his intentions was when he stopped them anyway. That's true. Um, so yeah, he definitely, well, I mean, he's facing these charges, so we'll see what the outcome is, but it just seems like a lot of people are sympathetic to the officers, I don't know if the charges. A lot of officers, a lot of officers are sympathetic. <laughs> well, even regular people, I've had a lot of conversations with even some black people. They're like, you know, well, he should have had backup, and you know, because of the struggle, and that's why, you know. Um, see, so see, the, only, see, the only thing is, like, again, the reason I didn't personally want to see the video, I know about it because I'm tired of seeing that. And it, and it does has, it has an impact on my psyche. I still just still got the image of how Trayvon Martin was laid out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How, how, his, how he was looking, his body was still and his mouth was open. That just, that just bothered me. Like, it just so, you know, you read the re reports of what happened. My thing is, like, okay, if he got out the car, if you put up, he got out the car. If he got out the car quick, you couldn't pull the gun on him and say, don't move. Like if you that's push, true. Don't move. That's you know, instead of you know, like don't move, stay right there. And you see a gun, like even if he's from a different country, you probably be aware that a gun. Okay, that's a gun. No, okay. You know, that's you know, true. Like, he didn't pull out his gun until later in the exchange. Had he did that initially, that could have, you know, um, made him halt or yeah. what have you. You know, um, yeah. yeah. And then he's been. Then he's. Then he was a police for quite some time. You know, he's not, he's not a, a rookie officer, you know. So That's yeah, true. So, yeah. so now I'll guarantee it's not his first traffic stop. I guarantee it's not the right. first time he, you know, if he's in rappers, especially in the inner city, it's not his first first bout. So, I mean, people say, oh, oh they try to struggle with him. He's alone and all that. But I'm just thinking, okay, you, you hold a gun out now and say, don't move, get on the okay. ground. I could probably understand it more than necessarily if he if he charges you. Like if, if, if you if you tell him freeze, don't move, and he still try to come at you and try to attack you, that part I can understand. Like if you shoot, you know, I don't know if I would necessarily try to shoot him in the upper body, but right, you know, because you police, you train, they train. So, I mean, I just, I, I still don't think, like you said, I think it's definitely uh, too far. I mean, people people are definitely entitled to their opinion, okay, no matter ethnicity. But I, I'm just, just got to put yourself in their shoes. I mean, it, it, I mean, how would you have handled that? You know, if I mean, that's the way you can handle it. Like somebody hop out the car, I back up quick. Hey, don't move, don't move. You know, anytime they ever came to my uh, car, they always had their hand on the gun anyway. Right, so, that's true. So, I mean, like you telling me like, okay, uh, you, you couldn't just step back, say don't move. He hop out the car quick. And you know, if he's a, a, a foreigner, you know, sometimes it's, it made me some communication issues there. And all yeah. That. Sometimes with, sure. the, with, the, with the gun, you know, that gun that, that called the great equalizer, that makes that make sense. <laughs> that makes that make, that make sense. That makes sense everywhere. We all know somebody, you know, right. take, if I pull that gun out, it that's a gun, you know. <laughs> so That's you know, true. So, so I just think, you know, it could have probably definitely could have been handled a different way. And the strange thing is, I know on my podcast, I had interviewed my, my fifth grade teacher a while back. Mm hmm. And I talked with him. I said, "Do you get nervous when the police pull you over?" He said, "All the time." He said, "All yeah. the time, still to this day." Because 
I know I know a simple traffic stop can with my life being taken. And that's how I, that's how I feel sometimes. You know, anytime I'm driving in my small city, because we got a lot of street lights out, it's a lot of blight now in the city of Detroit. It's a lot of dark areas in the city of Detroit. And especially on the side I'm from, you know, uh, well, I'm from the east side, it's like the poor side of Detroit. Okay. And uh overall. And so I just wonder sometimes like when the cops get behind me and I'm on one of them dark streets, would I stop? That's that's always the question. Like, like I mean, like, would I stop? Now, I could easily say I'm gonna drive like five to ten miles so I get to a lit area just because I don't feel safe. Yeah. But they might say I'm trying to retreat and could shoot my car up. Mm-hmm. You don't know, you don't know what could happen. They can say I'm trying to retreat and shoot my car up. And I'm just trying to get a safety so somebody can see me because I don't feel comfortable. And let me tell you something that happened to me. Also, I was uh, in, what was I think I was thinking, in uh, Beverly Hills, Michigan, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a suburb of, uh, of, uh, of uh, in the Detroit metropolitan area. And I was driving out there and I I left uh, the urgent care because, you know, we, uh, we do work with the, the business. I mean, we do work with, uh, the healthcare facilities. So I was leaving. And it's something I never do. And I was driving. And I was driving. Uh, didn't know my lights was out. It was nighttime. Mm-hmm. And they say, you know, I'm driving and uh a cop car get behind me. And a cop car get behind me. I'm like, I'm like, because I see the cop in front of me. them instincts kick in because the cop car was in front of me. And then I'm noticing like, oh, you know, so I see cut on his uh the the, uh, the lights. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, he about to go out to somebody, but then he pulled to the side like that. And I'm, <laughs> then I say, it's just me able to go. I'm, I'm able to go forward. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, what's, what's going on? So I drive forward. He just get behind me. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, crap. You know what I'm saying? Because so I'm, I'm like, what's about to happen? And I, so I look through the rear of the move, and I pull over to the side of the road, and I see there's a white guy. Now, this was a dark area. Okay. It was a dark area, but it was in the suburbs. People still was riding by. Now, when I, as soon as I pull over to the side, he hopped out so quick. Okay. I mean, he just, I mean, I, I, as soon as I pull, he just he just jumped out the car. And, you know, he, he he's walking up real quick, and I'm looking, at, and I remember I'm a licensed carrier, and I have my uh, my gun on the seat right there. Okay. And I, I kinda like right now, I, I kind of like it, but I just kind of like put, I kind of covered it because that's like how my like my the time was still a little chilly. I cut it, covered it with my hoodie. I covered it. It was on the seat right there, so I'm just I'm look straight. And he said to me, he's like, uh, I just know your lights was out. Just like that. I was like, oh no, I didn't know that. He like, your lights was out. He's like, I just know. He's like, you know, that's almost an accident waiting to happen. I said, I didn't even know that. He said, oh, you just gotta cut your lights off. And he went back to his car and drove off. Really? It was, it was a white guy. Okay. Now at the time my my, my heart on my life, I'm like, oh man, what's what's about to go down? You know? And yeah. that's just like, like like now just think about from my angle as a as a black man. Now, I wasn't doing nothing. Illegal. I just had my license, my gun, my gun, my license carried. I wasn't doing nothing illegal. I just had it over on my on my seat while I'm driving in my car. And then I see him walking up. My I said, let me cover this up. But it was still right there, you know, covered up. And he came and said, mm-hmm. Now what happens if you know I had panic? Like they say, some of these cops panic. Exactly. You know, what if I had panic and said, okay, this cop pulled me over, he, he walking real aggressive to my car. You know, he walked real quick because he walked real quick. He got out real quick and walked aggressive. He didn't stop. He didn't wait for me to turn off the car. He just walked extremely aggressive. I'm like, I'm like, wait a minute, you know. So, you know, so that was that was a moment for me. That's now, true. I think the way you uh, responded in remaining calm, you know, not this divulging extra information. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, I mean that that's crucial in uh, these moments. Now, now if I had panic and. You know how we, how we portrayed him, and I saw a panic. I had just started shooting a cop, and, and they were like, "That's a, just a violent, just a violent black man." You know what I'm saying? That's a violent black man. That's why cops do that. They, that would have been a narrative and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. If I had panic and stuff like that, because That's that was still, that, that was still a nerve nerve wracking moment for me. Because I'm like, definitely, he got he got off so quick, and I just had to do it like that real quick. I'm like, man, he he, because I didn't know he walked real aggressive. Like, and then all, that's what he said. I'm like. Then when he left, I was like, I exhaled. I was like, man, you know, because, you know, our, our life can be snatched from us. Just exactly. Like it could have went a different way. Yeah. So, I mean, it definitely had to be an anxiety moment, you know, for sure. And what, right. And what would happen if he had just 
looked on the scene and then saw he saw the gun. He would have panicked and thought you were a threat that he needed to yeah. eliminate or, you know, neutralize or, you know, yeah. this, this whole concept of a threat and they have to take out the threat and all of that. Yeah. So. And, and, and we don't realize how, how deep this stuff is. It's just, it's just crazy because that could have went any kind of way, like from mm-hmm. his angle, from his angle and from my angle. You know, it's just like, I'm just thinking like if you, a cop, like if you, been trained or he'd been trained like when you saw the man was unruly, if he was hopped out the car, boom, you know, pull a gun out immediately and say, hey, I mean, I just stay here. I mean, I don't, I don't understand like how you even got your stun gun when you got to wrestle with him. I mean, like, he, right. you, see him, you know, so it's just, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I ain't saying all cops are bad people. I know some decent cops are here because can't put everybody in the same bag, but, right. you know, you can manipulate technology. Trust and believe that. So, it's, so you just never know. True, 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 true. So we'll see. Um, you know, if he's charged with six, but he did get charged with secondary murder. You know, for fatally shooting him in the back of the head. Um, which you know, it definitely feels like that is justified in the way that this was handled. Um, next, I want to pivot and acknowledge Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth was the 19th, but it is observed on the 20th. So um, happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. I remember, I remember, <laughs> so, like, just, last year too. I remember last year. We, we did. We did. I even have my Juneteenth t-shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, last year, my family signed in May the Fed holiday on June 17th, 2021. It is the nation's 12th federal holiday. And the first new one since Martin Luther King Day in 1983. And Juneteenth is a celebration of the emancipation of the last slaves in the United States. And just for some historical information, um, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in September of 1962, but it took nearly three years more years before the emancipation was achieved. So that's why we, you know, recall 1865. Um, so 1865, the Union soldiers arrived in Galveston, Texas to announce the Civil War had ended and that the slaves were free. That's 1865, okay? And so um, they, so they, and that's supposed to officially free the slaves in Galveston, Texas. And then I'm trying to sum sum this up. Um, The end of the war also meant the end of, uh, let's see, religious persecution where blacks in some southern or some states like South Carolina being forced to worship in secret, which um, because all black churches were outlawed. So that occurred also Um, since 1865, black Texans and others throughout the nations have celebrated Juneteenth is a commemoration and an affirmation of Black culture and perseverance. On January 1st, 1980, Juneteenth became an official holiday in Texas. So Texas was the first state to actually um, have the holiday. And I know that um, just speaking with people that are from Texas, like they really celebrate it uh, largely yeah. there. And so your thoughts on Juneteenth? <laughs> well, um, personally, I personally love it just for, for us. To have something that we celebrate, you know. I, mean, I found my views on the whole slavery was actually being free thing, but uh, <laughs> well, you right. know, what I mean? but I, I do think it's good for us to have something that we celebrate. Now, uh, my, my only thing uh, about it, like I said, uh, how they gave Leslie, well, gave a federal holiday basically honor black people in this country like that, uh, because to me, I, I, I do admire the fact that. That we got that, and, they, and Black American history is American history. And I do think people need to know about everything our people contributed to this country, because a lot of people come right. here and they're unaware of everything we have done. They come here with a whole lot of disrespect that I, that I don't appreciate. So I, I, I appreciate yeah. that aspect of it, but for me, for me also, most importantly, I, it's important for us to be self-sufficient and and to know that. We don't necessarily need the government to acknowledge, you know, uh, or, or give us a holiday for us to, you know, have our own holidays, have our own days. 
and things like that. And celebrate like, our greatness, right? Right, for sure. Like this, exactly. like like some some circles, you no know, May nineteenth. We some areas we sell we call it Malcolm X Day. Okay. You know, so, you know it, it's you know it, it's just like that's good to have. I, 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 like I said, I appreciate it for letting people know. Okay, this is some, this is American history. This is Black history. You know, it's a holiday, and we we we've been acknowledged in that respect. So I do I do appreciate that. You know, that lets people know like about American history. But I just want more important on our end. I want us to know that we don't need anyone else to give us a day, just like anybody else. We could take a day. In some Hispanic communities, it's some. It's not necessarily federal holidays to celebrate some of their heroes and sheroes. Right. We are taking this day, and this is what it's gonna be. But that's, that's why we try for self sufficiency. When we say we say May nineteenth is Malcolm X Day, that's what it is. If we say, uh, you know, what was it? Uh, I want to. We get wrong. I know August. I don't think it's August. I don't know. It's in August. Garvey's Day. We said it's Garvey's Day. Okay. Know what it is. So, uh, but I do appreciate, you know, uh, you know, and it might be a little suspect, you know, it might be a little, <laughs> like I said last year, but uh, I, I appreciate us for having uh, our history acknowledged here. That's true. Uh, there were some moments that uh, kind of went uh, all over the internet, like, Walmart having the Juneteenth ice cream and things like that. And and I guess it's like they want to acknowledge it, but then it comes off across as insincere. You know, what's your thought about corporations doing these? That's that's, that's the main thing I'm getting at because it's like it, yeah. it becomes commercialized now. Right. Now you, you have some people selling red, black, and green flags. They're not even black. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so, so you, so I mean, so it's like, I mean, you don't really care. food truck, <laughs> you know? right? You don't really care about our history. You just it's just some furthermore, something to get the profit off of. Exactly, you know, it's something that we do. That's something we, Juneteenth has been something that you probably heard about. You saw, you know, some people in the black community celebrating in uh in uh in St. Louis. Just like I know people in circles after center circles of Detroit celebrate these things. We talk about these things like Kwanzaa and all that. We, we, it's things we've been doing, but now right. we're living in an era where "Quote unquote, Black Lives Matter," and it's it's a popular thing now. So it, it's cool because it's the popular thing to do now. So now everybody's on that. Kind of like hip hop starting in New York in, in black communities. Yeah. It was a it was a black community thing. Now uh, when it became globalized and commercialized, who's profiting off of it the most? Not even the creators. You know, oh, for so, sure. So so it, that, that's always a problem problem for me when we don't have ownership and control. But before it was a federal holiday, look what they was doing in, in Texas. Not even just like the state, but like the black community of Texas. Yes, you know, exactly. So that was that was the thing. Now some it's coming some furthermore to profit off of, just like Kwanzaa, started by us organization, Milani Karinga and everything. But here's the thing: when we buy things from Kwanzaa celebration, who we really buying from? Hmm. So, so I mean, mm-hmm. I think just, you know, we we got to get work on self-sufficient like we don't need whenever we get acknowledged by the government or something that they quote unquote give us is always uh there's always some ulterior motives to it yeah like i know in st louis i got to go or last year i went to a juneteenth festival and it was basically celebrating black, black entrepreneurs and you know there were tables or pop-up shops with people ch- selling their products that were black owned businesses. And so that was a way that people could support that. And, um, but you know, I don't think there was some, um, you know, non yeah. <laughs> black businesses that had to immerse themselves, you True. know, or, or All the time. Track, you know, All the time. Like they just wanted to take a part of whatever was going on or make some money too, what have you. And, you know, we're going to have that. But um, the main thing is that we want to, like you said, be self-sufficient. And how do we do that? By supporting Black-owned businesses, creating Black-owned businesses so that we can have um, that economical power. Right. And we need sincere Black business owners too, though. Yes. Because you you have some people who don't really care about us that's Black. Okay. You no, know, you got black enemies of black people too. And All right. Some of them, some of them will use the black thing, and just try to use it as a, 
you know, as an advantage. That's I really can't. I really care about the community they're doing. Like I'm, I'm out for me. You know, I'm out for me. But okay, I'm gonna do this business. I'm gonna claim the black thing because that give me support. That's kind of like a lot of artists. Is like you know, with singers, rappers, they don't really yeah. care about the black community, but they know okay, I'm black, so I'm a benefit. And you got some people. Like you got front black front and black businesses as well. Like some people who have black people out there, but it might be somebody else controlling it. So it, it's really complex, though. It's just like mm-hmm. we gotta, you know, really, we really gotta come together. And really, it starts with a conversation. Like it's right. one of the people you really deal with. Because it, it's times I thought I was supporting some black and found out I wasn't. You know, that yeah. some that's actually black. Like I was proud here in the city of Detroit that we had a couple actual. Black owned gas stations pop up. Uh, you know, and I've been supporting. I've been filling up. It's been crazy because gas is hot, but I've been filling up there. And so um, I'm, I, I like I like that. Now, I don't know necessarily know how much they care about community. You know, so okay. like, conversation with them. You know, so, but it's important for us to support each other and come together, though. It is for sure. I love that idea. So um, I'm glad that you are taking part in your city so that's awesome and then you are an entrepreneur so you understand um yeah. the struggle and plight of that yeah. not getting the support and that kind of thing and in those kind of festivals you have done those right so yeah. you understand but I, but I want to give i want to give you a uh, kudos here because you you're an example of somebody that's the real deal like you, you know the, you're creating a platform for so many of us to come on and and tell our story and then you see support it you know well, my book, which I greatly appreciate, and oh, read it, and, sure. and told me it was a you know a nice piece of work, and I, I really appreciate that. So, you know, whenever you're doing something I can help with, I'm, I'm here. You got a book coming out, whatever. You know, I'm I'm, I'm a buy for sure. Okay, that's what's up. We got you on video and audio saying and that. Video, so. <laughs> I can't fake it. You can expose me. Put it everywhere on social media now. Awesome. So, okay, so we'll pivot here as we roll it in. Um, some questions from the good people at Poddex. So what do you yeah. think is not fair in today's society? <laughs> well, a lot of things. But uh, what is not fair? Okay, what is not fair? Hmm. Well, it's simple for me. I'm coming from my point of view. Uh, racism. I mean, okay. it, it's, that's one of the things that's, that's not fair. You know, the racism, uh, how, um, you know, uh, Certain groups that you know, the group we come from, and how we they cut out of having opportunities. You know, don't get me wrong; some things that we could have done, some things we didn't take advantage of, but it's a lot of things that we weren't able to do, and we pay a catch up. Like when you think about homes and how redlined and all those things used to be, and certain loans and opportunities, and so. I, the first thing I would say, you know, in, in society, it, it's the racism. It's the main thing that starts with me, like, before anything else. You know, because sure. racism is not just a, about your ethnicity. It's, it's, it's a power thing. It's about groups competing for resources. But right, we always, and systems, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, it's, you know, mm-hmm. so, we, so we make sure we, you know, we got to start making sure we use the proper terminology, we use the words the right way. So many things you're taking out of context, like like what racism is, like, oh, you hate somebody because of their color. No, not no. That may be one of the byproducts of it, but it's it's a system. It's you know, right. it's groups competing for resources. And and we're a group that has been deprived, you know, the most deprived. And I would say, you know, besides the American Indians, and so I mean uh that's what I would say. That's one thing that I think is unfair. It's, it's the racism. Okay. And then let's see. I'll do one more. Who has or what has made the biggest impression on your life in the last year? Well, the biggest impression on my life in the last year? Well, that's a good question. I would say therapy. Hmm. I would say therapy. Okay. And I found that I found I would say therapy because I found therapy. I put myself in therapy. I found there to be very, very, very therapeutic, and it's, it let me know a lot about myself. Like I had there's so much reading, so much growing, and so much trying to get answers to things, communicating with other people, 
And sometimes you make so many so many strides, but sometimes you alone can only do so much. And you realize that I gotta get some help and there's nothing wrong with needing help and getting help. You know, that's, one, that's one of the strongest things you can do. And I just remember like, you know, God was so DMX passing last year. And I remember him saying uh, in the hood, he said like, when you talk about your your your, your, your uh, problems, people look at it as a weakness. He said, but one of the strongest things you can do is talk about your problems. And I find right. that to be 100% true. You know, through therapy, it let me know where I was going wrong and it let me know some of the things I need to heal from, from my childhood, some of the holes within myself, you know, and uh, I need to, you know, you know, address that because it was people I was letting in my life. And I thought all along I was doing good for the most part. But I also just realized that it was some healing I had to do. There's some questions I had to look in the mirror and address some things. And last year was, you know, this last year, you know, uh, has, has taught me a lot about myself, even more on the deeper level. Like you right. said, my book was introspective, but I know even more about myself. I know even more about myself when it comes to uh, dating and why I was having the problems I was having in dating. Why. Mm -hmm. I realized that, you know, a lot of times uh, I had to realize that I, deep inside, deep inside of me, I, I didn't realize that as long as I said I, was, I could be alone, I could handle alone. I was, but I realized that it was some holes within me. Mm -hmm. Made me, uh, you know, let the wrong type of people in my life. And, and, you know, I realized that I was trying to, you know, heal people. You know, I, was, I had that healer energy. I was trying to heal people. But in turn, it was me needing to, to heal myself more importantly. Definitely. And then um, dealing with the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, not only being ill or, you know, just dealing with the isolation and, you know, all of our lives got changed by that. Yeah. It is. So this is, that's, that's a great question. This last year has taught me a lot. I mean, just, mm -hmm. wow, I mean, just going through that and losing my grandma's other relatives and it's like, mm -hmm. and then losing another family on Christmas again. Like last oh, year, so wow. it, was, it was it was just a lot, but you know, for me, it was just the therapy has been the main thing, and also what the beautiful thing about it is, let me I had to dig deeper and question okay. myself, like, what do I really want? Like, why are you run into these people? Like, you know, you're a really good person, but mm -hmm. you sometimes if you're a good person, you, you get used, you attract people to just come to take, take, take. Right. You and your your intention is honest, but they they just come in to take advantage of you. They may look at your your uh your uh, empathy as a weakness. And mm -hmm. I learned through therapy, I said, my greatest strength is my empathy and my greatest weakness is my empathy. Okay. So yeah. learning how to manage that and Balance. deal. And... Set up boundaries and things mm -hmm. like that. Oh, boundaries. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's the word right there. Yeah, definitely. I, had, I definitely had to learn that because I, I, I would say, it's weird, I would say like my, in some ways I say my old self was my best self. Mm -hmm. I was like, like 25 when I would, uh, Oh, if somebody made me no good. I cut them off. My mother would say, "Like, baby, you you cut people off so quick. You only give people a chance." I said, "But when you know yourself, you know when somebody ain't right or something ain't right." And then I started to say, "Okay, maybe I do. Maybe I need to open up a little bit more." And that's when I started attracting the wrong kind of people. You know, right. who me know well. Like, you know, this ain't no me putting down on nothing on women. I'm a heterosexual man, so I date women. So, yeah, a woman, you go, you date men. You know, you know, so your view is going to be on the opposite sex you're dealing with. So it's just me. I realized that what I was dealing with, you know, and uh, it was me needing to really heal myself. And subconsciously, even though I didn't think it was, me wanting to be wanted. Yeah. And me wanting to be appreciated. And when you when you had, a, when you never had, when I said brothers like me, like I said, we, as I talk about in my book, we go unappreciated so many times. Never to have a, a sister come and rub your back and say she's proud of you, be sincere. I would to say you, you know you, you handsome and be sincere. And say she, you know she loves you and be sincere, and that she want to be there for you and that you a good man. I feel good out of that, and I realized that you know I wanted that, and I realized that was a, a weakness to to some women who didn't mean well. You know, I really, and they and it's deep, it's deep, Jim. When they and they portray like they was something that they wasn't. Right. And I didn't realize what it was until, you know, what it was done. And that's like the, the worst feeling. Like, you don't realize you got done up. You didn't got done up until, you, until it's done. You're like, damn, like, what the hell just happened to me? 
Oh wow. Okay. What therapy, what therapy, what therapy is like. Yeah. Uh, therapy is always like therapy. That has helped me tremendously, and I'm I'm grateful for that. And I'll recommend it for anyone, especially us as black people in America. We 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 need to talk about it. You know, we did we really do. I love to hear you say that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then uh, remind us again how people can find your book and your podcast. We didn't even talk about your podcast, so tell us about where we can find that. Well, you can find my, um, my podcast on YouTube. It's Black Man Talk. One word, Black Man Talk. You can find my podcast there. Um, you can find it on uh, other, other streaming platforms like Spotify, and things like that as well. And black man talk is, is simple. It's one word. It's it's just black men talking. Like black men don't talk. We don't talk about our problems. We don't we don't talk about heartbreak. We don't talk about the pain we go through. Why? Because we hard and we conditioned to be hard. To talk about pain is to be weak. To to say you shed tears is to say you weak. That's that's how we view it as we view it as weak. So a lot of us are conditioned to be hardcore well me i know the most human thing you can do is to to love the most human thing you can do is to feel and that's what black man talk is about is me talking Mm -hmm. about everything that black men go through you know the pain the heartbreak the betrayal the lies the 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 boss of women the 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 boss of your friends your family our dads our mothers everything you think of you find on black man talk and i'm uh oh pretty much open about anything on there so Mm -hmm. That's yeah, wonderful. I've um, checked it out several times, and you do really uh, share, you know, personally. Um, so uh, I recommend people to check out Black Men Talk. And you've had some some conversations, but sometimes it's just you um, sharing, you know. Um, yeah. So it's awesome that you can do that on the, the platform. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Definitely. Anything else to share? Oh uh, well. Uh, as Jen told us, we talked earlier about I have a, a new book that will be coming out. I said mm-hmm. in a few months, probably about around fall. It'll okay. be out. Uh, the thing is that that book, without giving away too much, I think it's going to be very, very relevant. Okay. We, a lot of things we talked about, a lot of things we talked about uh, before we, we went on the air, just going on in the community. Yeah. It's a lot of things. I, I think it's going to be important for, especially a lot of men, to check that book out and to see how you deal with certain situations and you know that you're able to come through no matter what, what happens. Like, you don't have to hurt nobody, you don't have to harm nobody. Right. Like what they do to you, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can move forward. And, you know, and the best form of success is. Uh, the best form of revenge is success. Mm. And live, your, live your best life. Definitely. You know, you know, I mean, a lot of times we, I did a podcast recently on don't wait for them to suffer. And I think that's so so important. Like sometimes we wait for the people that did us wrong or wrong us to suffer. And the thing is, the only way you're going to know they suffer is if you're still in their life, but if they ain't a part of your life, you don't know if they suffer or not. Exactly. And they, and they might have suffered. They might still be suffering, but if you see them putting up things anywhere on social media, whatever it might be, they don't. They're only gonna put their best things up out there. You know, so they could be that could be a facade, that could be fake. But you can't wait for nobody to suffer. You just gotta, you know, sit with your pain, deal with it, and move forward. And it, and this book on release is gonna be talking about a whole, a whole lot of things like that. And it's gonna it's, it's a, a novel, and I. I'm working really hard on it. And I, like I said, anything I do, I put my best foot forward and put my soul in it. And I, and I think you, I think you enjoy it. I think, I think you enjoy it. You had a cool title, or are you uh, not sharing that? <laughs> Gritty. That's Gritty. I love. Yeah. yeah. That's the name of it. That's so awesome. Okay. When you were talking about, um, you know, someone that you know you're trying to stick around and see if. <laughs> Yeah, I understand that because 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 you you're human like you and and, mm-hmm. and you know you know the most painful thing in the world and that's why I say men we human too we got feelings too you know the most pain the most hurtful thing in the world is when I had to learn is like even dealing with my my father is like the most hurtful thing in the world is when somebody do you wrong or wrong you 
and you waiting for them to suffer and they don't even give a damn mm-hmm. about what they did to you. See? You know, you that that'll make you might want to do something to really hurt them. You know, because right. you know, you know, you want them and you know they're wrong, and they, they probably know they're wrong, and they don't care about being wrong. And then that's you like right. you have, and then you, that's why I say your empathy. My empathy is my greatest strength, my greatest weakness. Because you be like, man, I, well, man, I want to hurt somebody. You don't want to do this, or y'all, I want to see them in pain. You you be bitter. You like, uh, okay, I want to. I wish I could see them fall somewhere and hurt themselves, and and I get the chance to laugh at them or say, uh, or they need some help with something. And I'm like, I can't help you with nothing. Or say, get the f out of my face. But that's you being bitter, and that's you waiting for somebody to suffer instead of just saying like, uh, they probably get there sooner or later. And, and it doesn't could, serve you to do that, right? It, it doesn't because I mean, what, what good what good is that going to do? What good is that going to do for you? Because the only way sometimes you can really hurt somebody is like actually hurt them physically. Like if you hurt them physically, sometimes what you're doing is you gonna hurt yourself because you end up going to going to prison, you know, or something like that, or you put your family's life in danger if somebody hurts somebody you love, you know. So it's, it's like a instead of sometimes you just got to charge things to the game, no matter if it's a relationship. Uh, like a romantic, or it was a your sister, your brother, your cousins. You just gotta pour that long handle spoon out of, them, pour that long handle spoon out on them, and, and keep it moving. Because, I mean, to me, that's the only way you can really get peace is to get peace with them. Because even if you hurt somebody, you still gotta deal with that that trauma. You still gotta deal with that trauma. You still gotta deal, with it, unless you commit suicide. And then when you commit suicide, sure. just think about it, you know you. You probably feeling a certain way for a couple months or a couple weeks. You might not even feel like that after that. You might not even care about what happened or what a person done to you after that. I mean, as you then denied yourself a, a, a chance of having a great life and helping so many people, you know. So it's just like we gotta, you know, teach us to value ourselves because we can talk about what what it's not worth doing to somebody, but until people really love themselves and value themselves, it ain't gonna matter. People gonna continue to do this. Men gonna continue to hurt. These women, if they don't want them, women don't continue to hurt these men if they don't want them. And that's not that's not going to change. But until we get some self-love and really love ourselves deeply and know that it's more to life than you know, just that one woman, that one man, or or just having certain people in your life, you still can have a life after that. Then that, that's how you that's how you can move forward. But until we understand that this stuff, this stuff is not going to stop. I mean, it's, it's only going to get worse because it's, it's getting – to me, the world getting colder, and we getting colder in our community, and less mm-hmm. feeling. You know, and I, I know I'm going on. I'm going to be going on like this, but I'm just, I just want to no. say, this, I just want to say this because I, I work with youth, and I remember asking them a question. I said, "Well, little baby walked across the street and got hit by a car. How would you feel?" Mm-hmm. I just recently asked these youth, and they was like, "Some of, most of them said like, oh, I was like, damn, that's messed up.' But then I go back doing what I'm doing because it ain't my people. And some of them said I wouldn't care." I was like, wow, man. I was like, I, I see if I see a little baby get hit, hit across the street, that's gonna mess up my whole day. You know what I'm saying? That's totally. gonna be a that's gonna mess that's gonna mess up my whole day. And it, and it's weird because if you deal with people like that, you know, how do you how do you deal with people that's like that? You know, right. So sometimes the only way to deal with people like that is not to deal with people that's like that. And when they becoming more and more common, what can you do? You know, I mean, like to me, it's just losing that decency but right this this, this uh this book i'm releasing is gonna tie in a lot of those things and, and i love to be back on talk about that because i think it's it's so important to our community what, what, for what, sure so you know i, I probably gave you gave idea of what's gonna be some of the things a little bit because i know you're smart and that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all, but you know without selling too much that's what it's gonna be you know centered around though okay that sounds really interesting and i will definitely um will have you back on so you'll be hearing me harassing you come back on uh <laughs> i always always enjoy your show so you know I, I, it's always a pleasure to come on so I'll, great I'll, your show is dope thank you i appreciate that okay guys so um we'll have the link posted for the black men talk podcast on youtube which is really dope you also can check it out on spotify and also we also have the book um, Black Boy Arise, which is on Amazon. Check that out, guys. Um, teachers, you know, looking for a book for, you know, male students in the class. You know, it's just really um, a good coming of age type of story to share with young people coming up. And I would just appreciate Trey being on. Thanks for having me.
All right, for sure. So we um, thank you guys for listening and take care. At this time, we're going to go ahead and conclude the episode. We greatly appreciate you listening. We invite you to follow us on social media. On Instagram, it is Woke by Accident Podcast. On Twitter, it is Woke by. On Facebook, it is Woke by Accident Podcast. We also have the new website up, www.wokebyaccident.net. Please check us out and also follow us on all of your favorite streaming platforms and please leave a review and share feedback. You can also reach out by Gmail, wokebyaccident at gmail.com. And every time you listen, we appreciate it so much. Thank you for listening and take care.